Dr. Willem, thank you very much uh, to you and to ODI for having me here to speak on this really important topic. And the reason it's so important is because the world economy is still in a lackluster state of slowish growth. And East Asia stands out for its performance of 5 6% growth rates. And so people are very interested in what's driven East Asia's success, and particularly this fast rebound since the global uh, economic crisis of 2008. And global value chains play a big role in some of this rebound. And it essentially refers to a phenomenon about the allocation of production across geographical space. And this particular type of industrial organization is quite sophisticated and has had quite powerful impacts on the way in which East Asia has grown and the way in which jobs have been created and the way in which poor people have been lifted out of poverty. And it's a pretty important phenomenon from that point of view. Um, and so East Asia has benefited in general, but there are some countries that haven't and some firms that haven't. And I'm going to try to give you some sense of that. And in particular, I've got these kind of four points I want to talk about. Um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about the concept and what it means. And then I'm going to particularly talk about, you know, has East Asia benefited from being in value chains? And I'm going to try to show you some macro indicators of what's happened in East Asia compared to other countries. And I'm going to focus also a little bit on the post-global financial crisis period, meaning the most recent years. And give you a sense of what the pattern of growth has emerged in the more recent period. And then I'm going to try to talk about things at, at the firm level, in other words, what it took certain firms to enter a value chain from East Asia, and then what kinds of policies were put around firms by governments in East Asia. Um, and then we can also talk in that context about this issue of industrial policy. And last, I want to talk a little bit about what, what, what lessons one may draw uh, from East Asia for anyone else. And, and I'll try to give you my, my take on this. And some of this is going to be part of a new book uh, that uh, will come out next year on production networks and enterprises in East Asia that I'm editing. And, and there'll be various papers from various colleagues as well. Um, and by East Asia, I'm talking about this set of countries that is Japan, the People's Republic of China, Korea, the 10 countries in ASEAN, Taipei, China, Hong Kong, China, and India. That's, that's what I'm talking about in terms of e East Asia. OK, so the, the, the essential uh, characteristic of this is the organization of production across geographical space. And this process is being driven by multinational companies, which are able to coordinate activities in this way, um, and foreign buyers. And if you think of the iPhone, you know, today the iPhone is largely assembled in the People's Republic of China, and the parts of components come from all over the ASEAN countries, and indeed some parts of it also in the United States. And much of it is sold in the United States and in Europe, as well as now increasingly in Japan. So that's the kind of organization we're talking about. This process has been driven historically by rising wages in, in home countries, particularly in Japan, which started in the 60s. And as costs rose, uh, production moved out. And um, they moved to the ASEAN countries uh, in the beginning. And then later, um, when the People's Republic of China joined the WTO in particular and liberalized its trade, it became a major production hub. And then the production re-centralized around it. And um, technological change has been a very important driver, as well as these um, costs of communication, which are very important for the coordination of these value chains. So this is essentially the phenomenon we're, we're talking about. I'm going to show you a picture in just a second. How we measure it is very difficult, and there are two competing approaches to measuring it. One is what's called the gross trade approach, and the other is what's called the value-added approach. Um, and I'm going to show you some stats on this. The the message of the drivers is that these are really led by big corporations, and they're driven also by market conditions, such as wages and things like that. But policy plays a role, and also country conditions. Um, and to try to get this type of production, we need a new type of policy paradigm, which I call liberalization plus. And we have to sort of rethink policy a little bit if we want to try to attract this. And we also have to think about the firms in a country and how they invest in the creation of competitive capabilities to get into these chains. And then we design the kind of policies that help that. But let me just very briefly just give you a couple of things. The, this is a diagram uh, produced by Richard Baldwin in, in one of his papers most recently. And the, the first box is really this big factory that had all the stages of production, all the inputs are in one place. 
And then the fragmentation idea basically means this factory gets spread across geographical space. And these stages A and B uh, could be in one country and stage C in another. And then you could keep multiplying this across space. So what comes into play are these coordination costs and also the policies that you put around the firm that you've got to think about in a very uh, careful manner. Now, how countries might attract these value chains um, really depends on the kind of skills that they might have um, in the country within the firm sector. So you have firms which interact together with other firms and that create the kind of uh, production capability and the efficiency. And that occurs in the context of an institutional system of skills, of, of finance, of technology institutions, of marketing institutions. And all of that is spurred by a set of policies. And then this links up with transnational corporations and others and enables value chain um, creation to occur within countries. And so this is the kind of paradigm that you want, want to sort of think about. So the policies that we need are liberalization, which obviously are the stuff in blue, but we need other things. And that's the real message I want to give. And we need to build in the infrastructure. We need to create the right kind of skills. We need to build the logistics. And we need all kinds of institutions. And that's the broad message I just want to leave you with. And I'm sure my other colleagues will talk about this. Um, let me just try to briefly uh, jump into what happened in East Asia and try to answer this question about has countries in East Asia and companies benefited. And as we know, East Asia has become rich, um, probably the most prosperous region in the world, through this entry into value chains and also through outward-oriented policies over several decades. And much of this occurred before the financial crisis of 2008. And this very impressive industrialization pattern, increasingly based on this organization of production over space has resulted in massive uh, amount of jobs being created, a big fall in poverty, and a very large regional market um, of, of, of billions of people, as we project in 2030, uh, coming out of poverty. There'll be some uh, 60, 80 million people only with $1.25 a day in 2030, compared with uh, some 600 million today. So this, this is the sort of pattern that may occur. Now, all is not well in East Asia, I must admit, and particularly in the post-global financial crisis period. Um, this particular form of organization has been hit by various types of shocks. Um, the first shock is the demand shock that came from the global financial crisis. There was a big fall in demand uh, in the United States and in Europe as a result of slow growth um, and certain pessimism of what might occur, and that affected the value chain very badly in East Asia. And I'm going to try to show you some numbers on this in a minute. Another set of shocks were the supply shocks. So we had the floods in Thailand. We had some political events there. Uh, we have the shocks that occurred in Japan through the earthquake and other things. Um, and then there was this risks of protectionism or protectionist tendencies that may have occurred. So there have been various shocks that have happened in the post-global financial crisis period, which have made the growth rate of the value chain countries uh, in East Asia much slower. And you'll see some numbers on this in a minute. Um, and what has happened is that there will be implications going forward for East Asia. Uh, and the whole issue of risk management has become a very important phenomenon, uh, particularly for East Asian countries and for firms within East Asia. And that's one of the big things that uh, people need to think about. Um, here's just a simple graph. And if you just look at the bar graph, um, you may not be able to see the numbers. But this just tells you the impact of this geographical organization. So East Asia had something like 20% of world trade. Um, in, in the 1980s, 85, and that goes up to some 30 odd percent and plus uh, because of this value chain trade. And then the other graph is really about the interregional trade. And something like 50% of East Asia's trade is with itself, and mostly that is parts and components trade which compose of the value chain. Um, here is something, again, you may not be able to see, but I'll try to tell you this in a very simple way. This is essentially the East Asian countries and the rest of the developing world. That is, so the 15 countries of East Asia, 15, 16, the way I've defined it, and everybody else, uh, Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and so on. And you have various indicators, uh, the rate of growth of manufacturing. Uh, you have uh, the share of manufacturing in GDP. You have high-tech exports. And then you start having indicators of, of per capita income and, and also growth rates. And what this shows you in the two distinctive periods is that in the period before the global financial crisis of 2008, the rates of growth of East Asia were really quite fast. I mean, there were some 7 8% a year over a 17-year period of, of, of growth. And this was for manufacturing uh, was the driver, and that's the first number you see. And the share of manufacturing value is very high. Um, and 
in addition to this, you've had this big export push into what they call high-tech exports, although the, most of that is parts and components. And then GDP growth is 5 6% a year, and then per capita income rises very highly. And those numbers are much bigger than those of the rest of the developing world. And the value chain phenomenon is a major aspect of this, the industrialization process in general, and then the value chain, uh, the way they've organized it. And that's a very interesting way to look at this. Now, in the post-global financial crisis period, you see these growth rates have all come down. Uh, and part of that is this, these shocks I talked about. And there's been a bit of a catch up in the rest of the developing world. And part of that is linked to commodities uh, that are very important in other countries. Um, and there are other uh, factors as well. And, 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 and you will see some of this uh, in, the, in the future. Um, but, but, but this is the interesting point. So there are some risks that have come about in the more recent period. And the management of risks at the level of the firm and the way the supply chain may change, as well as the management of risk of policy becomes the big issue. Um, let me just try to talk to you about the about this participation. And this is the heart of the question we're talking about today. And this is a graph that shows you the share of global value chain exports measured by something called the gross trade approach, which is parts and components trade at the six-digit level. And different uh, actors are there. And East Asia accounts for close to 50% of this today, uh, of the world. And the big player in this today is the People's Republic of China. Uh, and Japan is around 8%. Republic Korea is around 5%. And then the more developed countries in Asia and Malaysia and Thailand have around 2 to 3%, and the rest of Asia is 5 And India is less than 1%. So this is the Asian picture today. And you have some numbers there for the European Union and the United States. Um, and this graph gives you a, a sort of a crude indicator. It doesn't capture the value added that goes into these uh, countries' exports. Um, and it has other issues uh, about measurement. But it gives you some sense of which countries are important in this trade. So some countries are there and some aren't. And you notice that the, the shares of Latin America uh, amount to the equivalent to that of ASEAN. And Africa is, again, uh, roughly a number of that of India. So that gives you some sense of this trade um, and the way this is occurring. So only some countries are in this, and particularly uh, the People's Republic of China, Japan, Korea, some ASEAN countries. And then there's a lot of exclusion that's occurring. This is one of the other big risks that you see in the value chain is can this be sustainable with these types of patterns that may occur in the future? Just one quick question uh, Please. for clarification. How is this different from just global share in export? Um, th this is parts, only parts and components trade. Um, it doesn't measure all other uh, exports. It doesn't measure manufacturers either. And it's at the six-digit level. So this is one of the ways that you measure this type of trade. Because much of this trade is really the goods um, that go into the making of final goods uh, in a country. And this is how this thing is measured, one of the ways in which it's measured. So the point I want to make is only some countries have really got into this in a big way, and others haven't. And, and um, we can come back to this more in the discussion. <coughs> mm. The other uh, point that uh, you may want to look at uh, when we look at who benefits is um, some firms are more amenable to being part of this type of production, which is very sophisticated, very difficult to organize, requires a lot of transaction costs and scale matters. And so it's the large firms that are much more prominent. So what this shows you, and if you just look at the last bar for all countries, this is just for the ASEAN, uh, five of the ASEAN countries, and what you have is some 70-odd percent of the production network type of trade um, in the ASEAN countries, the five that I have there, comes out of large firms and small and medium enterprise, either as direct exporters or as indirect exporters, being suppliers uh, or subcontractors, is only some 20 odd percent. And it varies a bit by country. And the more developed ASEAN countries like Malaysia and Thailand, the ones that are already in the value chain, have a greater proportion of SMEs being more involved in this type of trade. So the point I really want to make is only some countries are involved in this trade and some firms within those countries involved. And large enterprise in typical, be it government-linked companies or multinationals, tend to be much more prevalent in this type of trade than the small and medium enterprise. Okay. Now let me just try to go into, um, rather briefly, the, the country conditions as well as the enterprise conditions. And so when we get into the country um, and the enterprise conditions, the important thing that stands out are the firm level conditions. And the, and the general message I want to give you, uh, and I'll show you some statistical evidence in a minute, it's the firms that typically are larger that are more amenable to joining this type of trade um, because they're able to uh, get access to capital markets. They get the information, the technology from their parent companies. Uh, they can cross-subsidize certain types of activity. And so scale really comes into play but also firms that invest in skills, um, training of managers, 
training of workers to global <coughs> standards, and that requires investments of something like 1% to 2% of sales if you want to be competitive in this type of industry. The other type of thing is, is, is really the capability to use imported technologies to a high level of efficiency so that price quality and delivery of global markets <coughs> comes in, and then access to credit uh, is another major factor. So at the level of the firm, firm heterogeneity um, comes into play, as, as according to people like Melitz, and that is very important for the types of firms that succeed in this type of trade. Now, in addition to this, um, the policy framework around the firms, if you remember that picture that I showed you, is a really key player. Um, and you need at the heart of this policies, um, outward-oriented trade and investment policies that attract FDI and also enable trade to occur. That's a core part. You also need other things, macro policies to stimulate savings and investment. You need um, particularly modern infrastructure and logistics. This is really core because the coordination costs of the supply chain are terribly important. And the higher the trade costs, the more difficult for a country to participate. And I'm really fascinated to hear uh, this the case of, of Nepal, which is a landlocked country uh, with um, you know, disadvantages of being in this. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot about the logistics issue and also the coordination costs. Skills and technology come into play, um, as well as um, other types of things that occurred, particularly the push into industry uh, that occurred in East Asia. Uh, public private sector partnerships are again very, very important. Now, some economies used industrial policy uh, in the sense of policies beyond these functional policies to promote entry into value chains. And uh, these were particularly Korea and, and, the peop and, and, and uh, Taip Taipei China, but also the People's Republic of China have been very successful. Now, the moot question is, can others do this? And that's something we should talk about in a, in a, in a bit. Um, and the other thing that you have now, particularly since the 2000s, is that increasingly these mega regional trade agreements are being used by many countries to try to facilitate the reduction of barriers uh, and to move into value chain trade. So I'll just show you very briefly um, some numbers. Here is the, uh, a, a chart that shows you a statistical test of the factors uh, between firms that are in value chains and those not in value chains. And you essentially get the conclusion that, that size matters, skills matter, technology matters, uh, and so on. So at firm level, there are very important factors that come into play. At the national level, um, you know, there are some very reassuring things here that you might see. Um, and what you have in red are basically all the value chain economies. On the bottom, you have the value chain economies, and then you have the rest of, of Asia. Uh, and, and what's very reassuring in this is that the cost of starting a business, if it's lower, um, it's conducive to uh, being into a value chain. And likewise, if your trade costs are lower, um, that's a very reassuring thing that everyone probably would, would assume would be the case. Another one matters is infrastructure. And again, you get exactly the same uh, type of story. And if you have better developed credit markets, uh, you, you're going to do better. Um, so again, a very reassuring story um, that you'd get. Um, skills uh, matter in all sorts of ways. Um, and if you're at a, at a higher level of human development, being literacy, and that's very important for factory workers to be literate, to be able to understand maths, um, to be able to understand English. Uh, and language skills are very important, and also uh, to be able to work within a productive environment. High level skills also comes into play, as, as the other chart shows you. Again, reassuring uh, that these things come into play, particularly as you want to move up the value chain curve. Um, and here's what Steve Jobs thinks of this, and here's the man himself. And he thinks that the number of engineers were terribly important in Apple's move, uh, particularly to the People's Republic of China. And, and uh, you know, he talks about scarcities in skills, and that's a very important clue for developed countries if they want to try to get more back into manufacturing. Uh, and his point is that reshoring isn't going to occur um, without the skills, and that's a really interesting message from him. Uh, R&D and technology are terribly important as well um, if we want to get into this type of train, as is moving into a, a better supplier base. So there are lots of environmental factors that, that come into play as well. Um, now, um, this last uh, point about the policy concerns these mega regional trade agreements that are happening uh, throughout East Asia. And there are these two big processes, the Trans-Pacific Partnership process and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And my own personal take based on other types of research is these trade agreements on balance help firms to reduce barriers and to move into um, export markets. And they tend to be very important when the WTO um, is in itself uh, in, in a bit of a stalled state, uh, particularly the Doha round. And unilateral liberalization is not occurring. And these mega regions can on balance work. Um, I won't go into this. OK, so the last bit I just want to mention are some insights for others. 
So getting into value chains is obviously very important associated with prosperity, and certain East Asian countries have done very well by, be, by getting into this. Um, and, and those really are uh, Japan, the People's Republic of China, Korea, Thailand, and Malaysia in particular have done much better than others in this type of production, uh, and some firms, um, SMEs uh, in particular, um, are, are not that involved, and that's a very important question. Now, how this occurred is no um, magic, and the more I study this, I realize you know, luck was partly important in East Asia. East Asian countries um, were located close to dynamic Japan. And at that time, when wages rose, uh, factories moved out uh, due to cost competitiveness. They moved to the ASEAN countries, and it was terribly important. And there were other factors involved as well. And China jobbing the WTO and being this mega economy that had very good initial conditions, um, very high levels of human development that were done during the pre- um, or the earlier period, and I don't know how, what you characterize China's earlier period, whether it be communist or something else, uh, were very important in providing the skills that people needed, and also this massive market with a lot of pent-up demand. So history and initial conditions are very, very important. Um, mm. And um, But once it begins, the process becomes very market-led and led by transnational corporations and buyers and output, and then very active strategies um, at two levels of firms as well as countries have been important historically for East Asian countries to get into this and to be able to shift within comparative advantage over time, and were particularly important for local firms to, to, to do this. Um, now, in terms of strategy, um, I like to think of, you know, there was a wave of, of issues around liberalization. People said this is a panacea to get into everything. This is important, but you also need to deal with structural bottlenecks, missing markets, and issues of this kind. And so supply side policy, skills, building skills, technology, credit markets and other things are terribly important, and I think that's what we've got to do. Now, industrial policy, I, I, I take a very uh, eclectic view on this, and my simple take is uh, Korea um, and Taipei China and, and China itself have done this, Thailand has done it a bit, Malaysia has done it a bit, S many successes but also failures. And um, today it's much harder to do, uh, to pick specific industries, to pick specific firms, for a whole host of reasons, including local content regulations in the WTO, and also the capacity to run this kind of policy. But it did work um, initially in East Asia and also in Japan. So again, a very interesting thing we've got to do. The interconnectedness of these types of chains means that there's a huge premium on uh, management of risk, and, and we've got to think of that in terms of diversification of suppliers, and there may also be an opportunity for the rest of the developing world to pick up niche areas in the value chains that may occur. Um, it'd be very hard for, uh, let's say, um, a small country in South Asia to make a car, but it could make bits of a car, and, and so on. That would be very important. Um, and we've got to try to find ways to mitigate these risks towards protectionism and so on, and I think these mega-regional trade agreements uh, provide a lot of space. And in terms of the beneficial uh, part of this, we've got to also have safety nets to deal with these adjustment issues. Some sectors are going to lose very badly, um, and we've got to be very careful on this. And the very last point I want to make is that I don't think there's any um, one-size-fits-all strategy. I think there are country-specific approaches we've got to do, and we've got to think about all that very well. Thank you so much, Chair, for your indulgence. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ganesh. So in terms of the questions, it's some firms gain, um, some countries gain. Um, we need to think about liberalization plus, um, although you need to explain in a minute or afterwards how different it is from the post-Washington consensus. Um, and, and thirdly, um, it can't really be replicated because some of it is part of, based on luck uh, rather than hard work. Um, so let's, let, that's some, some good starting points. Um, we, let's now go to, uh, to Jody for, uh, for your perspective on, uh, on <coughs> the global value chains in, in Asia, in particular Cambodian example.